when wise men testify. Let's open up our Bibles to the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 2, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 12. Matthew, chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 1 through 12. Let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's Word. Matthew, chapter 2, beginning with verse number 1. The Bible says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east of Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And the reason Jerusalem was troubled, beloved, because if any other king was worshipped or paid homage to, except for Caesar, there could be war. Civil war would break out downtown Jerusalem. So you can see this was a very disturbing message. Amen. Verse number 4. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ, or the Messiah, the Mashiach, should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, or Bethlehem Ephrata of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, that is in Micah 5, 2, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not thou the least among the princes of Judah? For out of thee shall come a governor, a messianic king, that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he said to them, uh, to them uh, he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, search diligently for the young child, and when ye have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also, you liar. <laughs> and when they heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, till they came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding joy. And when they were come into the house, now notice, beloved, not into the stable, when they were coming to the what? Into the house. It's important that you understand that. They saw the young child, not a baby or an infant. You know, because we do a lot of things by tradition today, don't we? But I want you to see what the scriptures say. They saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in the dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Praise the Lord, the Lord warned them. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we praise you, we thank you, Father, during this time of the year, the Christmas season that we've set apart to worship uh, the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Emmanuel, God with us, God incarnate in the flesh. Lord God, I pray that you would give me the words that I have to say this morning. Father, there's a lot of things that have been going on, and Father, I just need your mindset. And I pray that you'd anoint the word and open, a heart, uh, open up the hearts of the people that they may receive the engrafted word with meekness and kindness, which is able to save their soul. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen, and you may be seated. Beloved, there is a lot of wisdom in this Christmas story about the wise men. Now, this wisdom, as we study, it can help us also become better and wiser Christians who seek the Lord just like them. And if you just do a cursive reading of this story, beloved, you're going to see a couple of obvious and glaring ambiguities here. For example, number one, there isn't much known about these sages. We're not sure about where these sages came from. We're not sure how many there were, but at least there were three. We're not sure, beloved, what kind of animals they rode on to reach the Holy Family. It could have been camels, it could have been donkeys, it could have been horses, it could have been all three of them. We don't have any idea. And beloved, we're not sure specifically where they came from. Many scholars believe they came from either Iran or Iraq, but we don't know for sure. And we don't know how these magi came to know the messianic prophecies about the birth of Jesus. Perhaps it was from Balaam's prophecy way back in Numbers 24, 17, who said this. He said that there shall be a star that shall come out of Jacob and a scepter, that is a messianic king, a ruler, shall arise out of Israel. And then he said, till Shiloh come, till the Mashiach comes. So they could have known from that, beloved. And also we know this. Because of the Assyrian and Babylonian captivity, the Jews had been in the, di the diaspora, spread out all over the world. And they certainly were familiar with the religious writings of the Jews and especially the prophecies of Daniel because Daniel had spoken about the coming of the Messiah. So they could have learned that from them, beloved. We don't know. So how the Jews believed, uh, uh, or the Magi believed, beloved, how they got this, we don't have any idea. But we do know this, 
They believed that this wise man, that these wise men believed that this king was going to be uh, the ruler in all Israel. Now, that were, those were treasonous words if you spoke that out loud when you were downtown Jerusalem. Amen? And so, beloved, we don't know why these wise men even would bother come to Israel, to Jerusalem, to worship a Jewish king. Why would they do it unless they knew that there was more to this than we see right here? Amen? So that's the first thing we see. There isn't much known about these sages. Secondly, beloved, there isn't much known about the star. We know that the guiding star was indeed a unique phenomenon, beloved. It was no ordinary star. And we know that this guiding star was a bright and brilliant star that shined in the eastern sky. And we know that this guiding star was a glaring and glorious supernatural guiding star that luminously shined in the dark nocturnal heavens, beloved. And it seemed to providentially move them and move and guide them to exact location where that star wanted them to go. But we don't know much more than that, beloved. For example, this guiding star could have been a supernova. It could have been a planet. It could have been an angel. It could have been a superstar. It could have been a uh, meteor or a comet, as suggested by some people, but we don't know exactly what it was. But we do know that it was a guiding star. Would you say amen out there? Beloved, it could have been the Shekinah, the Shekinah glory of God that hovered over the tabernacle and over the Ark of the Covenant when the Jews came to worship the Lord. That could have been what was up in the nocturnal sky that night. We don't know for sure. But what we do know for sure, that this star was specifically and supernaturally sent by God himself to announce the birth of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you say amen out there? And beloved, what God wanted us to see that night, that there was going to be a virgin birth, an incarnation. God was going to become flesh in this person, this king, beloved. And through him, the gospel would go forth to both Jew and Gentile. That was the purpose for this guiding star. That was the purpose for the Magi. They were Gentiles, showing them that not only Jews would be saved, that the Mashiach would come and he would save Gentiles also. Would you say amen out there? So there's much that's a mystery that enshrouds this guiding star, ladies and gentlemen. But we do know for sure that this star was and still is a very puzzling enigma that was supernaturally put there by Almighty God, and he did it for a specific reason. You know, it's amazing how God likes to announce things sometimes. I mean, he sends the most extraordinary or out-of-the-ordinary things uh, to be able to arrest our attention of what's going to happen. What God wanted to do was publicly announce to the whole world, ladies and gentlemen, you imagine, that there was going to be a Savior who was going to tiptoe across the Milky Way he was going to come down to this earth, he was going to become flesh, he was going to die on the cross for men's sins, and ultimately he was going to resurrect again from the dead, and he was going to send back to heaven. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, when the wise men followed that star, it took them probably two or three, uh, it, it was probably uh, two or three years, uh, or how do I say it, after the birth of Jesus. Jesus was probably, at that time, two or three years old, because we see when the wise men got there, it said they came to the house. Now, Jesus was born in the stable, but ultimately we see that he's in the house. So Jesus now is approximately two or three years of age. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, the reason they came, beloved, to Bethlehem of Judea, because they knew that a divine Lord and Savior, a messianic governor, a redeemer, a ruler, was going to come into the world. And listen to me now, divinity had now entered humanity, so humanity could become like divinity. Would you say amen? In other words, beloved, the Son of God became the Son of Men, so that sons of men could become like the Son of God. Would you say amen? The whole purpose of the conversion of the Christian is the transformation of the body, transformation of the soul, transformation of the spirit, transformation of the convictions that we have done supernaturally by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So when you see these creations today, and you, uh, as you drive by, they have a manger scene, then you see the wise men bowing down there with their camels, beloved. That's tradition, and that's okay. We don't, uh, we're not going to hold their feet in the fire for that, but it's not biblical is what I'm saying. The wise men did not see Jesus till two or three years after Jesus was born. So, beloved, what I want us to do right now is I want us to see 
look at these magi from the east and see if there's something that us folks in the west can learn from these uh, magi. Would you say amen? When wise men testify, beloved, the first thing I want you to see is what the wise men thought of Jesus. What the wise men thought of Jesus. Look what it says in verses 1 and 2. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east of Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. You see, beloved, the wise men thought that this new king of the Jews was going to be greater than King David. And King David was a great king. But King David, as great as he was, was not as great as his son, King Solomon. David had set up the foundation for him, but Solomon, nobody had a kingdom like Solomon. No one had the riches of Solomon. No one had the prestige of King Solomon. But this king, the Magi understood that this king was going to be something different. He was going to be greater. And so, beloved, Bethlehem of Judea was about six miles south of Jerusalem, and this is where Jesus was going to hail from. And I told you last week that Bethlehem, Bethlehem means house of bread. King David was born in Bethlehem. The Mashiach was going to be born in Bethlehem. Would you say amen? Not only that, beloved, Bethlehem, okay, of course, was from the tribe of Judah. And the Bible says that the Mashiach would be the lion of the tribe of Judah. Would you say amen? Now let me talk to you a little bit about King Herod so you can understand him. King Herod reigned in Israel for about 42 years. In other words, he reigned from 37, 37 B.C. to 4 A.D., beloved. But King Herod was a surrogate king. In other words, he was put on the throne by the Romans, and he only had the amount of authority that the Romans would allow him to have. But he ruled tyrannically, I should say, over the children of Israel. Now, our Lord Jesus was born approximately 5 or 4 B.C. under the reign of King Herod. Now, the reason the Jews did not like King Herod was this. King Herod was an Edomian. In other words, he was a descendant of Esau, the, the twin brother and rival of Jacob, his brother. And, beloved, being an Edomian and not being a Jew, the Jews absolutely, the uh, Edomites, were the avowed enemies of, of Israel. In other words, Jacob's descendants and Esau's descendants were always banging heads with one another. And here you have King Herod, who's an Edomian, sitting on the throne in Israel, and he now is ruling over the, uh, the Jacobites the, to, to rule and reign over them. And ladies and gentlemen, that was unbelievable because they're saying, you know we don't care for this king. So you know what King Herod did? Listen to me. He spent 46 years building the temple downtown in Jerusalem. He spent tons of money building that temple. Temple. This was the temple that Jesus came to. This was the temple that Jesus preached at. This was the temple where Jesus turned over the money changes. King Herod had built that. And he did that because he wanted to garner the affection of the Jews. He was hoping by me doing that, they'll truly look at me as the king of the Jews. But the fact of the matter was, beloved, they didn't do it. So when King Herod heard that there was a king going to be born downtown Jerusalem, a little bit off over at uh, Bethlehem there, you know, he got a little threatened. You see, a rival king was going to be sitting on the throne now. And that means this was going to threaten the authority and the position of King Herod. King Herod couldn't have another king, especially one who would be a Jew, sitting on the throne in Israel because he'd be booted out. And so he lied through his teeth, beloved. So what he did was he said that I'm, I'm, I'm going to wing this because I'm, I'm looking at the time here and we have baptism. What he did, beloved, was this. Uh, quickly, I want you to look at verse 3. He says, When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together and demanded of them where Christ should be born, and they said unto him, Bethlehem of Judea. For thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not uh, the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently uh, what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may also come and worship him. 
You see, the first thing that King Herod did was this. He said he didn't know where the Messiah was going to be born, so he called an ad hoc religious council. So he brings these chief priests and these scribes in, and the scribes and the chief priests themselves, they don't like Herod. So Herod puts it to him. He says, where's the Messiah going to be born? And they quote to him, Micah 5.2, But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, out of thee shall he come forth unto me, who shall be ruler in all Israel, whose goings forth have been of old for everlasting. So they put it right to him, beloved, and he tells them exactly where this Messiah is going to be born. When Herod heard this, beloved, he heard this sobering truth. It greatly scared and infuriated him. So he thought that the only thing that he could do now was go and kill the baby Jesus. So he had a private meeting with these uh, wise men. He said, you know what? Why don't you go and find that young child, and when you find him, come back and tell me. You see, I want to worship him also. I mean, good night if we have a king of Israel and he's truly Jewish. I want to be able to worship him. But you see, beloved, that was a deceptive lie, wasn't it? It was a satanic ruse. In other words, it was a sinister plot to now kill Jesus. I was going to have you read verses 9 through 12, but I can't for time's sake, beloved. But anyways, the wise men continued on their journey, and as they did, that star rested right over that precise and that particular house where the young child was born. In other words, almost like a, a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, she puts that little brood, that star stopped right over the house, beloved. So here they are. They're looking and they say, this must be the place where the divine one is going to be born or was born. Now, beloved, mind you, they didn't have any idea how old the Christ child was yet. You see, that star, it, it took them 40 days. They traveled 1,200 miles, by the way. That means they, they must have covered 30 miles a day to come from the east all the way from Persia all the way to Jerusalem. So they didn't know how old that child may be. Or whatever, but when they came, they find this child, and this child is now two or three years of age. And you know, beloved, what amazes me about this whole thing, this whole story, is that God constantly and continuously started speaking and working through these unsaved magi and God fearers. They did not know the Lord, they were not saved. The scripture gives no hint of that whatsoever. None whatsoever, ladies and gentlemen. But you know what? They obeyed as much of the light, the moral and spiritual light God gave them, they obeyed it. And you listen to me, any person, I don't care if he's in the deepest, darkest Africa, I don't care if he's in the China or the Sudan, or wherever he may be, if he obeys all the moral and spiritual light God gives to his conscience, he becomes a candidate for salvation. God will start moving in that person's heart, and God will providentially put someone in that person's path that they may come to know Jesus. Would you say amen? In Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35, beloved, the apostle Peter, he goes to Cornelius' house. Now, Cornelius is a Gentile. Remember, the gospel, the Great Commission was supposed to go to the, from uh, Jerusalem, then all Judea, and then Samaria, and then the uttermost parts of the earth. So now the gospel is going to the Gentiles. It's going to Cornelius. Peter is stunned. His Jewish prejudices can't believe it. But then when God showed him the grace that was upon Cornelius and his family, and they were all gathered there to hear the word of the Lord, listen to what Peter said in Acts chapter 10, verse 34 and 35. He says, of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that worketh righteousness is accepted by him. In other words, God accepts as a candidate for salvation the unsaved prostitute who fears him. And God accepts as a candidate for salvation the unsaved drunk or drug addict that fears him. Or the, uh, the uh, fornicator or the harlot or the homosexual, or the sinner, or that religious person, anyone that fears God, truly fears God, God himself will accept that person as a candidate for salvation. Would you say amen out there? You see, God is inbred in every person, a God-shaped void, a God-shaped uh, uh, vacuum and vacancy that he's placed in their heart. Why? Because God takes the divine initiative in our salvation. And the Bible says in the book of Ecclesiastes that God has built eternal life into our heart. Listen to me. The unsafe world, 
How many vitamins can I take? How much exercise should I do? Should I do aerobic, anaerobic? What should I do? What are they doing? They're looking to live longer, amen? And I'm not against living longer, okay? But the reason they're doing that, and they are knowingly are doing that, is because God has built eternity inside of us. Wouldn't you say amen? You see, we crave it, and we don't even know it until we become uh, uh, Christians, and we praise the Lord for that. But, beloved, the whole incident, as we study this story, smacks of the supernatural. Note the supernatural guiding star in the providence whereby God led the unsaved wise men. Note the supernatural warning, beloved, that God gave them in a dream. Note the supernatural direction God gave them, and also, beloved, the supernatural protection that God not only gave the wise men, but also that he gave the Lord Jesus Christ because ultimately he sent them down to Egypt. Would you say amen to escape the tyranny and the murderous hand of King Herod? Oh, beloved, how much more will God supernaturally lead Christians who now belong to him? And how much more will God warn Christians by dreams and visions, beloved, for those who fear him? You know, over the years as a pastor and as a minister, Many times God has warned me in a dream, especially about things that would happen to me. And whenever, whenever God gives me a dream like that, beloved, I always say, Lord, if I get this two or three days in a row, I know it's definitely you. And when it does, I prepare myself because I know God is speaking to me. But you see, beloved, how much more will God guide and direct and protect and deliver us from all of these trials and troubles and tribulations if he'll do that to wise men who were unsaved, who did not know the Lord yet? Would you say amen out there? Now, beloved, why in the world did God call these people wise men? Now, that's a good question, isn't it? Why in the world were they called wise men and then written down as holy writ, as a record, for you and I to be able to read. Published in a book. And it's, a, it's lasted for generation after generation after generation. Why would God call them wise men? Well, beloved, the Holy Spirit doesn't call them wise men because they had college degrees or academic credentials after their name. And the Holy Spirit does not call them wise men because they were dignitaries or politicians or men of nobility. And the Holy Spirit doesn't call them wise men because they were Nobel Prize winners, beloved, who invented or discovered some uh, cure for some terminal disease, even though as good as that may be. But that's not why the Holy Spirit had called them wise men. You see, beloved, the Holy Spirit called them wise men for this reason. Because when they heard the voice of God, when I say heard it, inside of them, when they saw the star of God, they said, you know, we have to go and diligently seek for whom this star is pointing to. Boy, that would be a good lesson for us to learn, wouldn't it? For us to go out and seek just like these wise men so we too can be wise men. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, they sought diligently to find and worship this divine one, to be able to Praise and honor him and exalt him and magnify him, beloved. Oh, I wish that nowadays men from the West, wise men from the West, would also do the same things, but unfortunately not many do. You know, there's a lot of talk today about education, how we need to be, really get educated. And, uh, you know, if you get educated, you get wise. Beloved, let me tell you something. Education does not give you wisdom. God is the one who gives wisdom. Experience is what gives wisdom, amen? You can theoretically read anything you want in a book, but until your feet are in the fire and you go through it, then you'll understand a little bit about wisdom. Would you say amen out there? Now, beloved, listen to me. The Bible says this in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, that without faith it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, exists, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. See, the wise men were called wise men because they diligently sought the Lord. How about you? Do you do that? Do you diligently seek the Lord every day? Do you seek him in prayer? Do you seek him reading the scriptures? Do you seek the Lord? If you do, then God says, you know what? Then you're a wise man. Would you say amen out there? And God rewards wise men who diligently seek him with forgiveness and with pardon. And God rewards them with salvation. Beloved, can you imagine? God adopts us into his family as sons of God who are higher than the angels. 
And God also rewards them with uh, uh, blessings and hope and favor and gift and graces, beloved. And God gives them heaven and God gives them eternal life. God says, I will give you my very life to you. You will live forever with me in the eternal kingdom of God. Come on and say amen out there. You see, beloved, what I'm saying to you is this here, is that you can be as dumb as a post. You could have no education whatsoever. But if you start reading the Bible and you start seeking God, diligently seeking God, God says that you're a wise man. But if you're a type of person that's highly educated and you think you're really intelligent and you think that you're a genius, you're a person who nobody can talk to because you know it all, let me tell you what God calls you. God calls you a fool. Now that Hebrew word fool means you are a dope. A better rendition of that word is that you're an idiot. Now listen to me. In Psalm 14.1, the Bible says this. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. God says, what? The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Now, beloved, look at outside right now. See the sun? Look at creation. Creation testifies. It's called in theology, as we teach this in, in the seminary students, that's called a general revelation of God. Man can look outside and says, you know what? There must be a grand architect or designer of the universe because his fingerprints are on everything. And then God gives us what we call an inner moral revelation. That's our conscience. It instinctively and intuitively tells us when we do right and wrong. Where did that come from? Animals don't have that, but we do. And then God gives us the special revelation of the canon of Scripture. And the canon of Scripture reveals God's word, will, and ways to man, and it reveals God's person and power and precepts, but it especially reveals the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of the living God, and salvation by grace through faith in Him, by the power of the Holy Spirit through the gospel. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, the fool says in his heart there is no God, but yet everything testifies that there is a God. You see, a lot of people today, beloved, they say, well, I, I, I'm too busy. I, you know, I want to seek after my education or my job or my career. Or I, I, I'm going to seek after fun and sex and materialism and all these things. God says, you do that. If all that's all you do, you are nothing but a fool. You're an idiot in my sight. In fact, what they become in God's sight, in the Old Testament, God called them a wicked man, not a wise man. See, a wicked man denies what he sees and touches with his tactile sensibility. He sees, sees, tastes, smells, touches, okay? And God is saying, I've given you these tactile senses so you can know for sure beyond a shadow of a doubt, not only through what you're experiencing, but in your heart that there is indeed a true God in heaven. And if you believe that and you diligently seek him and you think about that, and God says, in my sight, you're a wise man. Now, beloved, listen to me. If you don't do that, think about it. What's really going to truly gratify and satisfy you in life. You know, as you get older, remember that when you were younger, there was a lot of things that you wanted, thought you wanted to do or whatever, but uh, I mean, I've done all the travel and I ever want to do in my life. Uh, and you know, when you're traveling all the time, you can't wait to get home to your own bed and eat your own food and put your feet up, right, and let your hair down and not have to wait in line for a, uh, a cafeteria to get a meal or whatever it may be. And I'll tell you something, beloved, None of these things in life are going to justify you and sanctify you before our holy God. What are you going to say on the day of judgment? Well, you know, I got my Ph.D., and so that ought to save me from the burning, boiling, bubbling pit of a devil's hell. No, I won't do it. I hope you get your Ph.D. Good for you. But don't put a period after it. Keep on studying and keep on learning and be a diligent, seeking, wise man. Would you say amen out there? And so, beloved, there's several things I want you to notice about these wise men. First of all, their, dis their dedication. Look at verse 1. It says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east of Jerusalem. Now, beloved, it, it's amazing to me. They must have had some real deep beliefs and convictions in their heart about the importance of this dignitary that they were going to meet because they were willing to travel from the east all the way to the west to see him who was king of the Jews. 
You know what God said to the children of Israel in the Old Testament? And what God said to their Babylonian captors? Because God is the God of the Gentiles also. He said this in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29, verse 13. He says, you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. You hear that? Not just a casual seeking. You must seek for God as with silver and gold, the Bible says. And I told you in the Old Testament, they did that with picks and it was a lot of work. And it's a lot of work, and I'll tell you why. Because eternal life is something you can't get from anybody on this earth, amen? It's not something you can earn. It's not something you can buy. It's not something that someone can bestow upon you except Almighty God himself. Come on and say amen out there. And so, beloved, does it sound like you? Do you diligently search for God with all of your heart? There's so many today are so apathetic in their search for God. And they're so careless and uncommitted. I've seen other Christians that are complacent and indifferent, beloved, and they don't understand the true pearl of great price that they've got in their heart. It's Jesus Christ and eternal life. They don't understand that. And they're just complacent and casual about it. And unfortunately, God says in the day of judgment, when Christ comes, a lot of people like that will never darken the doors of his heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not cast out demons in thy name? Have we not done many wonderful works in thy name? And I will profess unto them, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. And so if you're going to seek after God, you want to be diligent about it. Would you say amen? So that was their dedication. But secondly, beloved, notice their distance in verse 1 also. I won't read it, but they came all the way from the east. Imagine that, beloved, 1,200 miles in 40 days, beloved. And a lot of people won't even travel 30 miles to come to church or 10 miles to come to church. i got a sniffle, so I'll stay home. I, I've got a little bit of a headache, so I'm going to stay home. But here's these wise men pack up their, their dromedaries. They pack up their horses, their donkeys with all kinds of food and water, and, and they travel 1,200 miles, ladies and gentlemen to come and see him who was born king of the Jews. You know, though people around here in America, because we take the church for granted, we take our Christianity for granted, but in far off distant places, and I'm talking about places like China. You know in China, and I've taught you before, you know a lot of Chinese have to have their services in silence. They will meet underground, and the pastor will be over there, say I'm the pastor over here, and the congregation will be there, he'll be leading the singing, and they'll be like this. Total silence. They're praising God from their heart there and lifting up their hands. Why? Because they don't want anybody to hear them so they won't be turned in, arrested, and ultimately killed. Far off places like in the Sudan, ladies and gentlemen, or Iran, Iraq, and Africa. And you know, they'll walk and they'll travel hundreds of miles and for many hours just so they can go to a church and hear the word of the Lord preached. They want to know about the divine one, this king of the Jews, him who was born, this governor, this ruler over Israel. Would you say amen out there? So, beloved, when wives men testify, we should really listen to what they have to say. But not only their dedication and their distance, beloved, notice the discomfort. In other words, I'm saying this. This journey was a very long, hard journey. Now think about it, ladies and gentlemen. They had to cross over deserts and mountains. They had to four deep streams. They had to contend with all of the bad weather, the wind, the burning heat, the cold at night, beloved. There were no hotels or no motels. There was no restaurant down the street where you could get a quick meal if you wanted to. You couldn't go and put your feet up in a nice, warm, cozy place, but they were willing to do all of that just so they could be in the presence of the King of the Jews, the Divine One, the Ruler, Him who was greater than King David, Him who was greater than King Solomon, to be able to be in His presence. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying this, is that God says, whatever it takes for you to worship, do it. Do it with all of your heart. When we come to church, a lot of people don't like to sing. You're not singing to me. You're singing to who? But God, God says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Praise Him with all of your heart. 
Now, heaven's flag, I told you, may fly at half mass when you sing, but you sing and you praise him. When the wise men finally met up with the young child Jesus, they fell down and worshiped him, beloved. Can you imagine? Praise you. Hallelujah. Glory to the King of Israel. And they weren't even saved yet. And yet we can't get Christians to even do that. And they're willing, willing to miss church. But there's one last thing I want you to see. Their danger, beloved. The wise men had to deal with a lot of dangers, not only with the weather, the terrain, but in them days there was a lot of marauding bands of bandits, robbers, those who would attack you, those who would kill you, those who would take everything that you had. And yet they were willing to do it, beloved, just so they could be in the presence of the Messiah. You know, today believers all over the world during this Christian Christmas season, beloved, as we look in China, as we look in Sudan, as we look in Iran and Iraq, as we look down in Africa, a lot of them are being persecuted. A lot of them are being attacked and killed and martyred for their belief in Jesus. And when their persecutors tell them to deny this Holy One, this Divine One, they said, we will not do it. Why won't they do it? Because they know what Jesus said in Mark 8, 35, Jesus warned that whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's sake, he says, shall save it. So I exhort you today, because it's coming to America, our feet are going to be put in the fire, but don't you ever deny the Lord. You will pass from death unto life if they execute you. Would you say amen out there? Now, beloved, I'm going to skip along here. That was what they thought of Jesus. But I want you to see how the wise men sought for Jesus. Look what it says in verses 2 through 8. It says, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea. For thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor, a messianic king, that's what that word is, that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent to them uh, to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I also may come and worship him. Beloved, what was it that so stirred these wise men up that they were willing to take all these chances? What? in the world. It, it couldn't have been human. You see, beloved, what it was was something that was supernatural. And it's the same thing, beloved, that happens with us when we seek Christ, who is the Lord, who is the Savior, and who is the King. Now listen to me. You may want to write this point down. I've got a couple of points here I want you to see. First of all, how these wise men sought for Jesus was through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Oh, how we forget that the indwelling Holy Spirit inside of us the blessed illuminator, the resident teacher, the, the divine occupant, the divine enlightener that opens up the word of God to us, beloved, dwells inside of us. And so God takes the divine initiative and he stirs us up to go hither and thither, to start looking, start asking the questions that we need to ask. We can find him who is king of the Jews. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, he supernaturally calls us and he supernaturally uh, convicts us, and he converts us, and he consecrates us, and he supernaturally changes us. It is the work of the blessed Holy Spirit that was stirring up the wise men, and also who does this deep work in us. You know, in Jonah chapter 2, verse 9, Jonah had to go preach to the Ninevites. The Ninevites were Assyrians. They were brutal. They would impale people. They would put a sharp stake and they strip a person down, and they'd have him sit on that stake, and I don't have to go be any more graphic than that. But God sent Jonah to go preach to the Ninevites, and you know the story. He ultimately didn't want to go. They threw him overboard. A great fish ate him, swallowed him, I should say. And Jonah went down, the Bible says, to the bottom of hell. A lot of people believe he died and literally went to hell. But God snatched him out, and he had that fish burp him out on the beach. Now, this is just me what I'm about to say. <laughs> I 
You can't be inside these gastric juices of a big fish like that and not turn white. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he must have been like an albino. So if you have an albino walking down the streets of Nineveh, repent ye, for the Lord's going to destroy the city. And you looked at that guy and you start listening, wouldn't you? <laughs> I mean, you blub it. Gastric acid in your stomach, more than for the mucous membranes, you could eat a lot of things. It's probably doing it to mine right now. But <laughs> But I believe that with all my heart, and Jonah said this to them. He said, you need to repent. And Jonah didn't want them to repent because the Assyrians were the, the avowed enemies of the Jews. And so if, if they repent, then the Jews are going to think I'm a traitor. And if they do repent, or if they don't repent, they're going to start persecuting us again. And then God breaks forth and he says this in Jonah 2.9. He says, Jonah, salvation is of the Lord. God wants to save all men, Jew or Gentile. And some of the worst, the most filthy people in the world have been saved because the Holy Spirit has done a deep work of grace in their heart. Would you say amen? Oh, beloved, when wise men testify, we need to listen to what they have to say. Jesus said this in John 6, 44. He's dealing with his own Jewish people. And they're religious, and they're going to the synagogue, and they're worshiping in the temple. But Jesus makes this profound statement in John 6, 44. He says this, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. No man can come to God unless God divine, takes the divine initiative and starts pulling him, starts drawing him. And he does it via the Holy Spirit and through the gospel. Would you say amen out there? You see, that's what God was doing with these wise men. So in our sinful, fallen state, beloved, we can't come to the Lord unless he first deals with us. You know, the Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 9, that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men call slackness, but is long-suffering to us, who are not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Would you say amen out there? So, beloved, let me ask you a question this morning. Is the Holy Spirit dealing with you? Is the Holy Spirit calling you? Is He convicting you of something? If He's doing it, beloved, you need to listen to what He has to say. So not only the ministry of the Holy Spirit, beloved, but how these wise men sought for Jesus through the message of the Holy Scriptures. In verses, uh, chapter 2, verses 3 through 6, beloved, I, I, I'm not going to read it for brevity of time. But the important thing we need to see in verse number 3, the, the, uh, 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 the king Herod, he's troubled because he knows now that these chief priests have told him where the Messiah is going to be born. And they used the scriptures. The scripture was the standard to find out what the truth that God had spoken was. Would you say amen out there? You see, the Bible is the inspired word of God. Christ is the incarnate word of God. You cannot separate the two. When I got saved, I never had anybody witnessing to me. I made a deal with God. If he got me out of a certain situation, I was in Vietnam. I said, when I come home, I will go to church and I'll read the Bible. I came home. I was a Catholic at that time. I don't believe there's a Catholic church alive that has an air conditioner in it. And it was September. It was hot. And uh, people were lined up to go to confession. And so I finally get to the confession. I said, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. And he's saying out loud, you what? Huh? You did what? Huh? And I'm saying, shh, everyone's going to hear me. <laughs> you did what? And so I come out of the booth, and people are lined up there. Now it's so hot. They're sitting against the wall and everything like that. I come walking out kind of sheepishly. And he said this to me, give me a hundred Our Fathers and a hundred Hail Marys. And I said out loud, a hundred? So I walk on, I go to the altar, I get down. <laughs> I said, oh, Father, what? Never, 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 never. When I got through with that, I said, oh, you're the rest at home. Bye. <laughs> but I kept reading the Bible. I've got it right in there, the Nashville Bible House. I didn't know anything about the Bible, beloved. You know the one with the big pictures in it? I, I was like a Pharisee walking around there. Get this big, you know, pictures of the thing. <laughs> but I kept reading it and reading it and reading it, and I didn't understand what repentance was, and I finally understood what repentance was, not penance. A hundred and a half fathers and a hundred Hail Marys won't get you to heaven. But if you turn from your sins to God, He'll save you. Would you say amen? 
And so, beloved, we can trust the Holy Scriptures. Would you say amen? Like the wise men did. And they were able to find Jesus. And they were able to meet Jesus. And they were able to worship Jesus. You know, in 2 Timothy 3.16, the Bible assures us that all Scripture, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for correction, for instruction, for reproof, and righteousness, that the man of God may be fully furnished unto all good work, fully equipped. All Scripture, all our faith, all our morals, beloved, everything we need to believe, the, the, the standard for you and I, beloved, the final court of appeals is the infallible Word of God, the Holy Scriptures. This is what the wise men were tr trusting in. Oh, we need to be like them, amen? You see, beloved, down through the centuries, Satan has tried to corrupt the Bible. He couldn't do it. The demons have tried to destroy the Bible. They couldn't do it. Sinful, godless men have ruthlessly attacked the Bible. They've done everything they could to make it so you couldn't read it, so you couldn't buy it. They burned it. But you know what happened, beloved? They ended up burning in hell, and the Bible is still the top selling book in the world. It's the most read book in the world. Ever since Gutenberg in the 16th century printed the first copy. Oh, I'd love to have a copy of that. It would be worth millions today if you could get your hands on it. But you say, Pastor Joel, how is this possible? How could God ever preserve his word for over three millenniums? Well, you want the short answer or the long answer? I'm going to give you both. The short answer is because he's God. The long answer is because God in his word has promised he'd do that. You see, beloved, God says in Psalm 12, 6, and 7, listen to what he says. He says, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Now watch. He says, thou shalt, quote, keep them. He says, and thou, O Lord, shalt, quote, preserve them from this generation and forever. And Jesus echoes that. In Matthew 5, 18, he says, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or one tittle shall in any ways pass from the law of God or the word of God. Would you say amen? Not one jot, one tittle, pop, would ever pass from the word of God. God says, I will preserve it. If they're ever going to be children of God, then they need to have the Word of God so they can become uh, not only sons of God, but they can go out and they preach the Word of God. Wouldn't you say amen? So I'm going to preserve it for them. You see, the wise men teach us a lot of that. And this Bible, beloved, this book that we have in our hand, what everybody's tried to destroy, it's been like a blacksmith's anvil that's worn out many a hammer that have pounded against it. Amen? And yet they're gone. And we still have this book right here. And wise men, they say, if you listen to what's in there between those pages, you pay close attention to them. Because in the day of judgment, what did Jesus say was going to judge us? He says, the word of God is going to judge us in that day. Would you say amen out there? And then, beloved, not only was there the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the message of the Holy Scriptures, but there was the miracle of the heavenly style. Look at verse 10. It says, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. In other words, beloved, God also, figuratively speaking, you know he gives us guiding stars too? Now, they may not be some star that's up in the heaven like we would like, but listen to me, beloved. Guiding stars can come in all forms in our life to lead us, amen? They may come in a form of a scripture that brings us joy unspeakable and full of glory. God may send a friend along. God may send a message along. Whatever God uses, beloved, it brings us joy unspeakable and full of glory because God says, I'm trying to lead you, guide you, direct you, protect you through that star. The question is, are you looking for that guiding star in your life? Are you doing what the wise men did, staring up into the nocturnal heavens? Are you looking how God is moving around you? I pray you say amen. You see in Isaiah chapter 12, in verse 3, the Bible says, Therefore with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. Hey, let me ask you something. Are you constantly dipping your cup of faith into that well of salvation God has given you? And drinking it down? Growing in grace into the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. 2 Peter 3.18. I hope you can. God says, drink it up. He who thirsts, drink it up. He says, keep drinking it. 
because you'll never reach the bottom. Well, let me just close with this. Point number three. <laughs> what the wise men thought of Jesus, how the wise men sought for Jesus, and what the wise men brought to Jesus. Look what he says in verse 11. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. You see, beloved, it was an ancient custom that whenever, an or, ancient oriental custom, whenever you went to someone's house, almost like today, you went to your host's house, what you did, you brought a gift. And the more noble or royal that host was, the more expensive the gift you brought, amen. Because you don't want to get on the good side of them. You're trying to impress them. You want them to know that you respect them, so you're showing them their dignity by bringing to them this expensive gift. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, God foreknew everything that was going to happen. So let me tell you shortly what he did. God foreknew the King Herod, the murderous tyrant, was going to try to kill the, the baby Jesus. God foreknew, ladies and gentlemen, that Jesus and Mary, the holy family, were going to have to flee down to Egypt to, to be able to live. And God foreknew that the Jews and the Egyptians were avowed enemies also. So how in the world is a Jew with his family going to be able to live down in the foreign land of Egypt? How is he going to get a job? How is he going to support his family? God says, I'm going to have these wise men come, and they're going to bring gold and frankincense and myrrh. Gold was an expensive commodity. Frankincense, beloved, an expensive commodity. Myrrh, an expensive commodity. And so not only did they honor the king when they came to them, beloved, but they were able to take this gold and take this frankincense and take this myrrh and turn it into cash so they could support them down in Egypt. In Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, and the Bible says, the text is fulfilled in Matthew 2, 15. He says, I called my son out of Egypt. You see, they lived down in Egypt. We don't know how long. It was until King Herod died. But he called them out of Egypt, beloved, and they were able to live down in Egypt because of the gold and the frankincense and the myrrh. Now let's talk about that one second. Gold denotes a most precious and invaluable gift given to royalty, beloved. And emblematically in these texts, it speaks of the sovereign dominion and divinity of the king of the Jews, beloved, they come to worship. Gold was a very treasured and expensive commodity worth a lot of money to defray and pay the holy family's expenses and support them down in Egypt. Beloved, this Christmas season, it would be a good time for everybody to remind ourselves of the gold of our love for God and the gold of our worship and the gold of our praise in our life to give to God, beloved, for that free gift that he's given to us of eternal life. Would you say amen? Number two, beloved, they gave him frankincense. This is a very rare aromatic resin, beloved, that constantly and continuously burned in the Old Testament tabernacle and in the temple, but also they used it for the holy anointing oil of the priests. Uh, I have a diffuser at home, and I burn frankincense. Uh, no, it's a mist. I don't burn it. But that frankincense is so aromatic. It smells so good. You've got to be careful with it, though. You folks who use these essential oils, you want to make sure it's therapeutic grade. And one drop of Cinnamon oil or frankincense is equivalent to about a half of a teaspoon of the powder. So you do, you've got to be careful if you cut it, you do it with water. Or if you put it on your skin, cut it with a carrier oil like jojoba oil or whatever. All that just to say, because a lot of people say, I'm going to use an essential oil. It can burn a hole in you, so be careful. But the point I'm getting at, beloved, is it's here symbolically it was representing that this Christ was going to be the sinless son of God. He was going to be the theanthropos, the God-man. That's why God had him bring it. And God wants us to give him the frankincense, the incense of our prayers and our praise, and also for our pious life, beloved, to be able to live to him, live for him. And so God says, when I see you living for me, it's like a sweet-smelling savor that comes up in my nostrils, like an offering from the Old Testament. Would you say amen out there? And lastly, myrrh, beloved. That was a very fragrant and expensive spice it was used to make perfume and medicine, and also it was burned in the temple. But you know why they used myrrh? It was a perfumed oil. You know, when Jesus died, 
Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus, they wrapped him with frankincense and myrrh. Why did they wrap the bodies of dead people, dead corpses, in frankincense and myrrh? For this reason. Because the decomposing flesh that's putrid, it's a putrid odor. It's a putrid smell, beloved. And so to hide that, they would put frankincense and they would put myrrh on it. So this typified the burial of the Lord Jesus Christ. How he was going to die, he was going to be buried, he was going to resurrect, he was going to ascend to heaven. And he was going to conquer sin, death, hell, and the grave for you and I. Would you say amen? So someday you and I can do it also. Right now he's in heaven. He's our great high priest. You know you need a priest right now? Have you still sinned? You need a priest to be able to stand and minister before the throne of grace. Amen. He's in heaven right now as our mediator, as our intercessor, as our deadman, as our advocate with the Father. What I'm saying to you is we need to listen when wise men testify. Now let me end with this. We need to give God the best gifts of our life. Give him our time, give him our money. A lot of us don't like to sacrifice anything. You know, if you're ever going to get in the ministry, beloved, the first thing they taught me when I got into the ministry, prepare to sacrifice and prepare to have your interruptions interrupted. <laughs> you're on the phone with someone, right? And then the lawyer calls. You say, wait a minute, could you hold on, sir? I'm on, and then somebody else calls, whatever. So next thing you know, you get... But you know, God wants us to give us him, his life. That shows that we love him. He wants us to be like this wise men, beloved, that will traverse whatever it needs to be to get across, to be able to worship him, to be able to love him, to be able to be faithful to him. The most important thing in our life is Jesus Christ, isn't it? The birth of God incarnate. You know, if you meet him, you'll never, ever be the same. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, the Bible says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, a new creation. All things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new. If any man be in Christ, are you in Christ? You know, people say to me, Pastor Joel, I don't want to do the things that I used to do. Well, beloved, you know, a lot of people think that what God does is he puts us in an arm lock and he says, you won't do that anymore. You know what he does? He changes our heart. We say, I don't want to do that anymore. How could I have been so stupid to do the things that I did? Because he changes us, amen? And you know what? The Bible says that that Holy Spirit is but the earnest, the security deposit of what's yet to come. If Jesus were to come today and we'd be glorified, we'd get the fullness, the fullness of the salvation God has promised us in Jesus Christ. Would you say amen out there? So, beloved, do you listen to when wise men testify? If not, then I think this Christmas would be a good time to begin. How about you? Let's go to the throne of grace.